Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Ian Tuttle of National Review is in for Jim Garrity today. We have bad, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. Ian, that's not a very good sign when today's the first day of the Republican National uh, Convention. <laughs> <laughs> you like to have a good martini? Maybe we'll get one by the end of the week. We're not promising anything. Uh, we'll uh, start with the first bad martini. And the, the two bad martinis are stories that obviously have gotten a lot of attention over the past few days, and rightly so. We started in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We woke up to the news, or at least heard the news very early on Sunday morning, of police officers once again being targeted, being ambushed, this time three dead, three wounded, with one of those wounded in very critical condition. That's a sheriff's deputy down in the Louisiana Capitol. We have the shooter who is dead. He did this on his 29th birthday. The authorities are still looking into the quote-unquote motivation, although we think it's pretty clear from the get-go what happened here. So, Ian, we see it once again. Baton Rouge, of course, was the center of some protests over the past couple of weeks after a police-involved shooting there. But after Dallas and now this, a fairly strong response from the president on, on Sunday, but this is only ramping up, and it seems to be snowballing at a time when we would hope Americans would come together and calm this thing down. We're only midway through it's going to be a, a hot intense uh summer um so i wouldn't be surprised if if there is unfortunately still more of this and of course louisiana this this event in baton rouge is sort of a dallas style attack but we should note there have been a number of other incidents over the past two weeks uh sort of copycat style attacks on police that have left police uh wounded in i believe missouri and tennessee and, and a couple other places and if you look at the statistics taken together, what you see is a massive spike this year in attacks on police. I'm not sure if this statistic uh, still holds, but it wasn't too long ago that it was it was safer to be a cop than it was to be an electrician. Um, but what we've seen over the past year um, is is increasing danger to police, and it's hard to you know to disconnect that from. Um, a climate that has been sort of stirred by Black Lives Matter and, and the rest. It's not to say that movement is is responsible, but, um, you know, basically we've seen these tensions ratcheted up and you get people like this shooter, like the shooter in Dallas, um, who have often, you know, pre-existing troubles or, or, or mentally ill who latch onto these things. Um, and it's worth pointing out, I think, that both this shooter and the one in Dallas were ex-military, and they appear to have had at least some modest mental illness, mental derangement. My understanding is that the Dallas shooter sort of applied to be part of the, the Black Panthers or the local you know, Nation of Islam chapter, um, and uh, I can't recall which it was, but they said they, they refused him entry because they said he was too unstable. And you have this guy who, besides posting a whole lot of things about cops, it was very clear what his motivations were, um, was also, you know, a member of a Facebook group about people who think that they were being remotely monitored by the government. And so I'm getting around to a point here, which is these are types of people who, if we had sort of stronger communities, a thicker array of, of people around them could be pinpointed before these things happen. But it's not just anti-police sentiment and it's not just mental illness and all of these things, but it's part of that thinning out the fabric of relationships and local communities that leaves these people isolated and makes these kinds of incidents much more likely, in my opinion. So all of that together I think just indicates what a difficult knot this is to untangle. Ian, uh, the president uh, is getting commendations on a couple of fronts. His statement uh, yesterday, his written statement, was uh, was rather strong. He said that the, these attacks are the work of cowards who speak for no one. They right no wrongs. They advance no causes. However, when he was in Madrid for the NATO summit, and he was asked about this at one of the press conferences, he says that the first thing the police need to do is admit there's a problem, and they'll, then they'll be safer. So what kind of message are we getting from the White House in a critical yeah. moment like this? 
mixed messages all the time. And I, I understand the, the position of the president on this because he's, he's trying to, to thread the needle. And I think, you know, it's, it's clear that he's very sympathetic to a lot of the critiques of the Black Lives Matter movement. So he's trying to please both sides of, of this issue. But there's a way in which he's not very good at drawing lines between legitimate acts of protest and something that's unconscionable. And we've, we've seen this when it's come to other questions of race throughout his presidency. We see this frequently when it comes to terrorism, where the president is very quick to sort of spin this around and make it about quote unquote Islamophobia and these sorts of things. He wants to sort of be on both sides of these issue and what it means is he ends up being mealy mouthed and his perspectives raise the ire and the suspicions of any of of, of of people everywhere. So it's all it would almost be better if he would, you know, sort of speak straight and try to be as as forthright as possible. We could at least sort of pin him down and, and move along from there. Ian, let's move to the second bad martini now and switch over to foreign policy because late last week, right after the terrorist attack in France, we had the attempted coup in Turkey. We saw the news breaking, I think it was Friday afternoon. And then the first thing, of course, people like you and I are thinking is, uh, okay, whose side are we on here? And we're pretty sure we're with the military, uh, given where Erdogan's gone in the last uh, several years there in Turkey. It became fairly clear uh, late in the evening, early the next morning, that this was not going to succeed. And somehow within hours, they knew exactly everyone who had been involved with this coup, not just the military people involved, which is probably fairly easy to identify in some ways, but that number is now up in the thousands. Thousands of judges have now been removed from office and detained. And basically, uh, there's a whole list of people removed from the government and could be subject to uh, intense prosecution, perhaps intense persecution. And one of the big fears here is that Turkey, which at one time was kind of this emblem of what a Muslim nation could be if they adopted the right principles, and, and even a member of NATO, is now following the path of neighbors that are causing tremendous destabilization in the world. And none of this is good for our national security. Yeah, this is a really grim situation. So this is uh, sort of exhibit A, you know, if you're going to kill the king, kill the king, right. um, which the rebels here obviously did not manage to do. And so what you have is a situation in which Erdogan basically has a, a, a sort of mandate to further consolidate power, which is what he's been doing over the last several years. I mean, you, you effectively had a parliamentary democracy that he has shunted into a, a presidential, quote unquote, democracy. I mean, this is a guy who they held an election effectively to make him president for life and the voters rejected it. And so they held another election so that, you know, he could get the answer that he wanted. It's a very troubling situation. And now he can use this as an excuse to further consolidate power. And you talk about these judges. What do these judges have to do with this coup? That's unclear to to observers from the West. It looks far more like it's a it's an excuse that Erdogan has to purge the ranks. That's all obviously very alarming as a matter of domestic Turkish politics. But what's even more important as far as you know Western observers go, this is the country that's sort of been the gateway for terrorists coming into Europe, as well as refugees. We're depending, and, and the EU is depending massively on Turkey's cooperation to you know, stem the tide of refugees and, and to do its, its part in, in sort of um, stemming this massive crisis overseas. The more unstable Turkey is, um, and the more sort of uh, unilateral power um, alternatively, that Erdogan has to has at his disposal to wield, um, those create serious problems geopolitically in Europe, and then of course with the terrorist question for us overseas. So it's a situation that a lot of people, I'm sure, will be watching closely, and one that raises raises serious questions. On to the crazy martini now. And Ian, if you were to try and figure out the issue that cost President Obama the most popularity, cost him huge defeats in two different midterm elections, you'd probably point to Obamacare. 
But uh, the president, not only happy with Obamacare, he thinks it should go even further. Uh, he, he wrote for the most recent edition of the Journal of the American Medical Association. I'm sure your copy is on your desk. Uh, <laughs> this is according to the Hill newspaper. President Obama is calling on Congress to add a public option to Obamacare to improve his signature health law. The pitch from Obama comes after he abandoned pursuit of a government-run insurance plan to compete with private insurers during the long legislative battle over health care because of opposition from some Democrats in Congress. Here's the most galling part. Quote, Public programs like Medicare often deliver care more cost-effectively by curtailing administrative overhead and securing better prices from providers. The public plan did not make it into the final legislation. Now, based on experience with the ACA, that's the Affordable Care Act, I think Congress should revisit a public plan to compete alongside private insurers in areas of the country where competition is limited. So, Ian, we're back to the original promises here. Uh, if you like your plan, you can keep it. And if you go along with my plan, we're going to keep reducing health care costs. Turned out just like you promised. The public option was in the original ACA bill, and it was killed by Democrats. Let's recall that this wasn't, you know, uh, Republican minority who killed this. It was a Senate, it was a Democrat controlled committee led by Max Baucus that nixed that from the original legislation. Secondly, we chose this as the crazy martini because it's, it's absolutely crazy to think that by basically having a, a Medicare for all or a Medicare for most style healthcare system, you would cut costs. That's just nuts. It's also crazy in the <laughs> In the sense of, I think it's Ed, Ed Morrissey writing in, in uh, I think it was Financial Times, who said, basically, he's, he's plugging in a public option here, A, because he's always wanted it from the beginning, but B, because the co-ops are failing. What were the co-ops? Well, they were basically modified public options done state by state. And so Ed Morrissey's line is, this is basically like saying we can save the Titanic with more icebergs. <laughs> uh, that's, you know, that's the, the logic here. And, and lastly, I, I alluded to this just a moment ago in, in 2009, when they were foisting the first massive healthcare bill on us, several Democrats, including then Congressman Anthony Weiner said, of course, single payer is the goal, right? I mean, this, you know, Bernie Sanders, uh, the Bernie Sanders wing of the party, that is the ultimate goal here. It's, you know, sort of, a um, they want to, a, they want the VA for everybody. They want, you know, a, a British-style NHS healthcare system. The public option is basically another stepping stone toward that goal. Uh, public option would, you know, help to. Uh, it wouldn't create competition. It would do. It would. It would do the uh, exact opposite, and it would sort of set the stage for eventually centralizing the whole the whole system. You could take the arguments one by one. Uh, that the president has has put forward and knocked them down. But I guess he's got six months left in his term. So, you know, YOLO, why, why not? Uh, <laughs> why not pitch this at this at this point? Who knows why he's choosing to do this now? But uh, I think it's probably just a, a good representation of the way he's thought from the beginning. Yeah, I think he's trying to push the voters more towards the left. Uh, Sanders certainly is driven Hillary Clinton there, although Hillary Clinton probably didn't need much pushing on that particular issue. And it's interesting because the Hill piece goes on to say that Obama will not be pressuring Congress to pass these changes during his remaining time in office, <laughs> yeah. and is instead laying out ideas for future policymakers. And obviously, with the Republican Congress, he wouldn't have got it anyway, but uh, he right. just likes to tweak. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Look, he's at a, he's at a great point to do it. You know, he really has has no consequences. He has the best situation he could have asked for in the way this election is breaking down. If you're Barack Obama, things aren't looking uh, things aren't looking too shabby, I suppose. But they are for conservatives, so it's a pretty <laughs> miserable day to start off convention week. We'll see if things get any better. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, happy Monday, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Ian Tuttle of National Review is in for Jim Garrity. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and be sure to tune in again on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.